Open your Bibles this morning to 1 Timothy chapter 2. Uh, we've got some hefty stuff in front of us, and we'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. But the last time we talked about, uh, we were here, we talked about the good warfare. Uh, we had been told in our opening study of 1 Timothy that some things never change, and that would include warfare. We are at battle with the adversary, amen? amen. But we also made note that the church and Christians spend too much time spend too much time waging the bad warfare, fighting against each other with insults and infighting over various matters of interpretation. Now, I've got a rather unusual uh, introduction today, but it has to be so based on the content. And I just want to start by saying, I believe Calvinism is wrong. I believe Arminianism is wrong. I believe they're both in error. And they are contradicting to some of the very things we're going to read this morning. And I want to talk to you a little bit more about those predestination free will uh, positions that has divided the church for now over five centuries. I want to add this this morning. I believe the mid and pre-trib positions on the rapture are wrong. I believe denying the rapture is wrong. And I will always say this, and I will say it with confidence and unashamedly, and I'll probably even say it frequently, but what I will not say is that the Calvinists, the Arminius, the mid-tribbers and the post-tribbers aren't saved. Because they believe that Jesus died for our sins and only his shed blood can cover our sins. And through him, one must be saved. So I will side with the original Bible answer man, Walter Martin who said on such matters we need to agree to disagree agreeably. And, you know, I fully expect to see the poster boy of Calvinism in heaven, the modern one anyway, John MacArthur. I believe he's going to be in heaven, but I don't disagree with a lot of the stuff he says, or I don't agree with a lot of the stuff he says. I disagree with a lot of the stuff he says. Now, in our study of 1 Timothy, we're entering into deep, theological waters. We're going to start studying things this morning that have stirred emotions, caused protests, and even accusations against God, the Bible, and Christians, even of misogyny. And Paul is going to switch gears from the pastoral responsibility to church life in our text. In coming weeks, we're going to deal with issues like women pastors. I'm glad we didn't land on that today. But we'll be there next Sunday, so don't miss it. We're going to talk about, in the future, qualifications for the pastorate. The identification and distinction between an elder and a deacon, and why there are female deacons, and or deaconesses, and deacons, yet not female elders. In chapter 4, we're going to deal with deceiving spirits and the doctrines of demons that are prophesied as being prevalent in the last days. In chapter 5, we're going to address the issue of how to treat one another as members of the one body of Christ. Chapter 6 is going to deal with the issues of uh, many of the social issues of the day, including the behavior of the rich and what money can do to those who love it. Now, you don't have to love money to have money, right? I mean, you don't have to uh, have money to love money, I should say. I'll figure this out sooner or later. Now, I, I found the old adage is true. Money talks. Yes, mine says that. All I've ever heard it say is goodbye. I've never heard it say <laughs> anything else. How about you? Now, I say all this in our intro today for a reason. The issues we are going to address in the coming weeks and months are heavy. As I said, they've been divisive. And even though they shouldn't be, Paul is now going to move into church life and he starts where such a transition must start and where every Christian should live, and that is with prayer and thanksgiving. As he told the church in Philippi in 4, 6, and 7, be anxious for how much? Nothing. Nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your request be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Now, the word anxious means to be troubled to the point of distraction. And some of the things we're going to talk about in coming weeks have troubled people to the point of distracting away 
from the message of the Bible, which is Christ and him crucified. None of the things we are going to study should distract us. All of the things we should are going to study should instruct us and therefore inform us and bringing about the end result of all of us being a more God-pleasing and Christ-like person because we've studied them. Now, I just kind of hit me in looking at and reading through the balance of 1 Timothy. We're actually going to start a series today, and we're going to have a title over the whole of the series, even though each individual message will have its own title. But what we're going to teach this morning, and our title that comes along with it, could be said over any passage we teach, as long as we're teaching from the Bible. And that is what we're going to hear today, and in the balance of this text, is nothing but the truth. That's our title this morning, Nothing But the Truth. Now, as I said, each one of our uh, messages each week will have a subtitle, so to speak, but we're going to begin a journey through a doctrinal cathedral this morning, and we have to have this as a banner over our minds as we listen to and read each thing we're going to encounter. It's nothing but the truth. As a matter of fact, King David said in Psalm 119, 160, the entirety of your word is truth. And every one of your righteous judgments endures for how long? Forever. Forever. Now, I quote this verse often because it needs to be. All of God's word is true. Not used to be. It is nothing but the truth even today. Now, the word judgments is interesting. It means divine laws. It can also be translated as formal decrees, but I think it can, and for our purposes, should be translated as verdict. All of God's verdicts are uh, endure forever. And therefore, what God has declared as divine law or has rendered verdicts concerning, they are final and unchanging. God has rendered verdicts concerning moral behavior. He has rendered a verdict concerning church order. He has rendered a verdict concerning roles, callings uh, in the church and giftings also. And also a host of other things we're going to examine that are true forever, including today. And listen this morning. This is probably the most important thing to launch into this series. And it's just this. They are true whether we like them or not. They are true whether we agree with them or not. They are true whether we practice them or not, because nothing we say, do, or think changes them. They are now and always will be nothing but the truth. So also before we get into our text in our second hour of our introduction, <laughs> I want to remind you, we've talked about this before, it's the law of bivalence. It governs any theoretical science or philosophical proposition. And the law by valence says, as well as religious uh, claims, the law by valence says any philosophical proposition or truth claim is either true or false. It cannot be neither, nor can it be both. Any proposition is either true or false. It cannot be neither, nor can it be both. Well, we know what the word of God is. It is nothing but the truth. Paul told the church in Rome in 3, 3 to 4, but what if some did not believe? Will their unbelief make the faithfulness of God without effect? Certainly not is his answer. Indeed, let God be true and every man a liar as it is written that you may be justified in your words and may overcome when you are judged. There's a lot of people judging God today. You know, if God were good, if God were love, if God were kind, this and that wouldn't happen. But let me inform us of this one last thing and then we'll start the message. If your opinion doesn't line up with the Bible, guess who's wrong? It's not the Bible because the entirety of the Word of God is truth. So as we head into some deep water, let's start where we always should when seeking to know truth, as Paul is going to call us to prayer and then get into some doctrinal housekeeping. Stand and read with me, please. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 through 7, where we'll find nothing but the truth. Verse 1, therefore I exhort first of all that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings and all who are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and reverence. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. 
For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time, for which I was appointed a preacher and an apostle. I am speaking the truth in Christ and not lying, a teacher of the Gentiles in faith and truth. And Lord, we pray that you would teach us this morning and give us ears to hear the truth that we'll hear today as we examine your word. And Lord, I pray that your uh, desire for us as spoken in uh, your word in the book of Ephesians would be the end result of our time, that we would be equipped for the work of ministry when we leave. Help us in that and bring us to that end, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Now, we could title this opening session, uh, uh, section, rather, verses 1 and 2, as the primacy of prayer, as Paul is exhorting the church, first of all, pray. And obviously, in prayer, we always give thanks to the Lord. Amen? Amen. Now, it's interesting what he says to pray for as he gives some directives within this prayer in light of uh, the governmental situations that both he and we are in today. Paul and Timothy were both under the governance of the very evil Nero. We are under the governance here in California of the very evil Gavin Newsom. Both men are great enemies of the faith. Nero promoted killing Christians. Newsom promotes killing babies. Two great evils and blights on the societies that were living under them. So what does Paul say to do? Pray for them. We need to pray for them. He goes further and says, intercede for them because it's God's desire that they be saved. And how are they saved? They're saved by coming to the knowledge of the truth. Now, he talks about supplications, which could also be translated as entreaties or or earnest or heartfelt prayers. The Greek word for prayers means praying earnestly or pray hard, as the saying goes today. Earnest prayers uh, uh, and entreaties are intercessions for the sake of others and their souls. And he attaches a temporal benefit to the church, to the eternal benefit of the evil kings and authorities coming to know God. And he says the end result of them coming to know God, at least it's implied, is that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in godliness and reverence. Now, this is implied in the text, but there's an important thing we need to recognize about that statement. Uh, Jeremiah 33.3 We're told that Jeremiah, remember, he was living under an evil regime as well. And the Lord says, call to me and I will answer you and show you great and mighty things which you do not know. Now, here's the proposition this morning. Do we need to know great and mighty things? Do we see situations around us that we don't know how they can turn around? They're all over the place. Could you imagine what would happen if every true Christian in California prayed for Gavin Newsom every day? Could you imagine if that happened? Well, let me tell you something about that. And this is nothing but the truth. If every single Christian prayed for Gavin Newsom every day, you ready? He may or may not change, but we definitely would. Our hearts would be completely different if we started praying that way every day. We need to remember and recognize that God's never going to violate a person's free will. But consider who is writing this and when it was being written. And we should take this instruction quite literally. And we also from it can glean the fact that the best leaders within any governmental system or any season of history in any portion of the world are born again Christian leaders. That's why we're supposed to pray for them because the end result is a quiet and peaceable life. And listen, if we have Christian leaders, they're not going to be perfect because no Christian is. We are being perfected. Amen? Amen. And Christian leaders won't make right decisions 100% of the time. But here's the distinct advantage they have over every other ruler, and that is they know God. And that gives them a distinct advantage over everybody else. This is why it's beyond silly to say Christians shouldn't be involved in politics. And, honey, I'm not going to say that's stupid. (laughs) I said silly. And it is silly because, listen, this morning, Christians are the only ones who know the only one who knows the future. He's the only one that can give directives regarding what's coming that is unseen by other people. That's why Jeremiah 
was told to write what he wrote, he will show you great and mighty things that you don't know, that you can't know, but he knows. He'll reveal them to us. One of the commentators I love to read anytime I'm, I'm beginning a new book, I always search for R. Kent Hughes. I, I love his commentaries. And he wrote this about verses one and two. He said, when we observe how the church of Christ has prayed and lived down through the ages, there is little doubt the slow progress of the gospel is due to prayerlessness more than anything else. God works powerfully through prayer. In fact, prayer, now this is current, something many of us lived through and saw and experienced. Prayer brought down the Berlin Wall. In May 1989 at Leipzig, in the historic St. Nicholas Church, where the Reformation was introduced exactly 450 years earlier, a small group began to meet in one of the church's rooms to read the Sermon on the Mount and to pray. The group expanded and moved to a larger room and finally began to meet in the church's sanctuary, which began to fill. Alarm the communist authorities sent officials to attend. They threatened the gatherers, temporarily jailed some. On prayer nights, they blocked the city's nearest Autobahn off-ramp. Then on October 9, 1989, some 2,000 individuals crowded into the sanctuary to pray for peace, while another 10,000 gathered to pray outside. What happened next? The Berlin Wall came down. Hughes says, coincidence? Question mark? No. This was the kind response of a caring, all-powerful God to the prayers of his people. And listen, God desires to save evil people. Yes. Amen. <laughs> that was a slow amen at first service too, so you're in good company. God desires to save evil people. And he does answer prayer. He does show us great and mighty things we think impossible. And we should be thankful that he is that type of God and does those kinds of things. But think about it. If this is God's will and good and acceptable in his sight, won't we have a better sense of peace and quiet and live in a godly, reverent life if we do what he says? Yes. Amen. Well, he just told us to pray for kings and authorities, pray for people in places of governmental power. And he said it under the reign of the monster Nero. Now, here's our point, and it's nothing but the truth because it comes from what we're reading. Listen, nothing will benefit us more in life than obeying the word of God. Nothing will benefit us more in life than obeying the word of God. And sometimes I think we forget that if getting us into heaven was the only point of saving us, then it would be cruel to leave us here after he saved us. Because this place is messed up. And there are evil people and bad things happen to good people all the time. You know, our, our uh, 316 mission team was out at the beach yesterday. Josh called me last night and said, man, I got to tell you something happened. And uh, his sweet little daughter, uh, Elena, who's a witnessing machine, uh, there was just a situation that developed with one of the other girls uh, talking to a, a guy who was very irate. And as soon as what 316 mission was all about was brought up, he went ballistic and started uh, getting demonstrative and aggravated. And, and, and little Elena went up and gave this man her Bible and said, this is the truth. You need to read this. Well, he threw it on the sand, and Josh was happened to be standing there and, and said, hey, you know, give her back her Bible. She just gave you her Bible. He said, no, she gave it to me. It's mine now, and she can't have it back. Well, the conversation ensued. Josh tried to uh, diffuse the situation a bit. It wasn't happening, so they just left. And after they went back to the meeting point at the base of the pier, here comes this guy back up to Pastor Josh with Elena's Bible torn into a 100 pieces. He tore up her Bible. Listen, this is the world that we're living in today. People have lost their minds. Terry and I were out for a drive the other day, and the fight breaks out. We, we drive through this part. We take our dog, Louie, out for a walk, and uh, then we kind of allow him to decompress by riding around and seeing other dogs and people and e-bikes. He hates e-bikes. <laughs> And so we just have, they ride by and he kind of unwinds a little bit. And uh, we're coming down this path. And every time we go, oh, but this is so beautiful. This is so peaceful. And then three guys jump out and go knuckles up in a car right in front of us. And uh, one guy starts pounding on the window and dropping F-bombs and doing all the other stuff that precedes a fight. And two young men get out. I mean, it's just like, what's the matter with this place? The world has lost its mind. 
And you know, yesterday would have been a great day for the rapture. Today's even better. Amen. But listen, Jeremiah said in 29, 10 through 12, for thus says the Lord, who's speaking? The Lord. The Lord. After 70 years are completed at Babylon, I will visit you and perform my good word toward you and cause you to return to this place. For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you a future and a hope. Then you will call upon me and go and pray to me, and I will listen to you, and you will seek me and find me when you search for me half-heartedly. No. How? With all of your heart. Let me break this down for us because it's often quoted without context. What the Lord says to Judah is you're about to go through the hardest thing you've ever experienced. You're going to be carried away for 70 years as captives to Babylon for your disobedience. While you're there, remember I have plans for you. So call upon me and pray to me and seek me and you'll find me when you search for me. How? With all of your heart. We are living in a time in America that we have never dreamed of. I never imagined that California would become home to half of the United States homeless population. Yeah. I never believed that California would become home to one third of the nation's welfare recipients. I never thought that we would see people living on the streets in the numbers that they do in, the, in our beautiful state. But listen, we can't lose hope. The peace that passes understanding that guards our hearts and minds through Christ Jesus comes through doing what God says, no matter what's happening around us in the world. And this is nothing but the truth because when we obey God, we just read a quiet and peaceable life and all godliness and reverence will be ours internally, no matter what's going on externally. doesn't matter what's happening. And this is the greatest personal benefit that we can have in this life. And one more set of verses. I, 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 was, I went a little bit long at first service. Um, that's not an announcement about second service, but I'm trying. But... I, I thought, well, I'll cut out Psalm 19. I can't cut out Psalm 19. We need to hear this this morning. Listen, Psalm 19, David says in 7 through 11, the law of the Lord is perfect. Listen to the positive result of the word, converting the soul. The testimony of the, of the Lord is sure. Listen to the positive result, making wise the simple. The statutes of the Lord are right. What's it do? Rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. And now we're reminded, more to be desired are they than gold, yea, than much fine gold. Then David illustrates it by saying, sweeter also than honey and the honeycomb. Moreover, by them your servant is warned, and in keeping them there is what? Great reward. What are the rewards? Well, we just read them. They convert the soul. They make the wise simple. They rejoice the heart. They enlighten the eyes. They endure forever. And listen, believe what the word says and do what it tells us to do. And this life will be rewarding in ways that the rest of the world cannot experience. But God does desire to save them all. And this kind of living is good and acceptable to God and most beneficial to you and I. And then Paul says in verse 4, it is God's desire that all people would be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. Now, this is why we're still here. We're still here to tell people how they can be saved because there's only one truth that makes men free. Now, the age-old debate between election and free will was the subject covered by literally every commentator that I read, and I read uh, quite a few on these particular verses. But I hope that this morning we can believe and practice nothing but the truth on these matters. Now, there's basically two camps, and uh, the Calvinist and the Arminianist camp, and, uh, you know, some people will, will divide Christianity into that. Listen, you don't have to be a Calvinist to be a Christian. You don't have to be an Arminius to be a Christian. You can be what I would like to call myself, and hope all of you are, we're Bibleist. <laughs> Amen? Because the fact of the matter is, the Bible teaches election. The Bible also teaches free will. And the Bible says that it's God's desire that all people be saved. Now, this issue has two main camps in their thinking. The 
uh, electionist or the elitist, as they are referred to, and the universalist. Now, how many know what Calvinism is? You know, some of you. Uh, it's called five-point Calvinism. That's traditional Calvinism. And it's described through uh, the acronym TULIP. There are five points to Calvinism. There's also five points to uh, Arminianism, which is the contrasting view or response, if you will, to Calvinism, basically initiated or authored by uh, Jacobus uh, Arminius uh, in response to the Calvinist teaching. And they're basically contrasting points. Now, the five points of Calvinism, TULIP. The first is total depravity of man. That's the T. The Arminius believes in the partial depravity of man. In other words, the Calvinists believe solely in the sovereignty of God and that only God can choose those who are going to be saved. Otherwise, man is totally depraved. Now, the Arminius position is the partial depravity of man in consistency with what Romans teaches that God has given to every man a measure of faith, meaning the capacity for belief. That's their contrasting position. The uh, U in the TULIP acronym of five-point Calvinism is unconditional election. In other words, God just picks some and rejects others. And the uh, contrasting response to that from the Arminius is uh, partial depravity, meaning that man has the capacity within himself. All men have the capacity to come to faith in Christ. Now, the third point of five-point Calvinism, the L of the TULIP acronym, is limited atonement, meaning Christ died only for the elect, which is not that one particular point. Not only would I degree, uh, disagree with, I would call it heresy, because 1 John 2, 2 says Christ died not only for our sins, but for that of the whole world. So that's not just an interpretive matter. That is an ignoring the Bible matter, and that's heresy. Now, in contrast to limited atonement, the, uh, the Arminius position would be exactly what I just quoted, that Christ died for the sins of the whole world, but not the whole world is saved because of that. Now, the other point uh, of five-point Calvinism, the, the eye of the tulip is irresistible grace. Because God unconditionally elects, he uses like a tractor beam his grace to draw the elect to himself. And therefore, all the elect are going to be saved. Well, the problem I have with that is people resist God's grace all the time. Even Christians resist God's grace. And that's why Paul would admonish us to have more grace because we resist what God is wanting to bless us with and take us to and through uh, all the time. And then finally, the, the final point uh, of uh, five-point Calvinism is the P in the, the TULIP acronym, and that means the perseverance of the saints or eternal security. So in other words, if God elected you to be saved, it doesn't matter how you behave. If you're elected, you're going to, through his irresistible grace, come to God, and there's nothing you can do to lose your salvation. The Arminius combats this with that your salvation must be maintained through good works and behavior, and that a Christian can lose their salvation. That I completely disagree with, and that's why I say Calvinism and Arminianism is wrong. We need to be just Bibleists and believe what the Bible says. You still here this morning? Yeah. Okay, so I could have titled this message more than you ever wanted to know about Christianity, but you need to know this, right? Yes. We need to know this. Because one of the interesting things about Calvinists, especially the hyper-Calvinists, and especially the young hyper-Calvinists, is they see the evangelistic field as being other Christians converting them to Calvin instead of converting non-believers to Christ. And that's where they spend all their time. And that's a waste of time. Because I didn't get saved by that JC. I didn't get saved by John Calvin. I got saved by Jesus Christ, and so did everybody else. Amen? Now, the universalist position is basically, and it's also an errant belief, is that because God is love and desires that all people would be saved, they're going to be. Now, if that's true, if Christ dying for the sins of the whole world means the whole world is saved, what do we do with this? Revelation 20, 11 to 15, John says, Then I saw a great white throne and him who sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away. And there was found no more place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God. And books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged according to their works by the things which were written in the books. The sea gave up the dead which were in it. 
death and Hades delivered up the dead who were in them, and they were judged, each one according to his works. Then Hades, and let me just pause there because this question comes up all the time. What's it mean, death and Hades delivered up the dead who were in them? The souls of the unbelieving dead go to Hades. Death speaks of the habitation of the body in the grave. So there's a bodily resurrection of unbelievers and they stand before God, reunited with their spirit that was in Hades, and they stand before God and they were judged according to their works. Then death and Hades were cast where? Into the lake of fire. Is that another description of heaven? No. We're told this is the second death. So if there is a second death, there must be a second death. Right? So, and anyone, say anyone. Anyone not found written in the book of life was cast where? Into the lake of fire. If the universalists are right, and because Jesus died for the sins of the whole world, everybody goes to heaven, that means the lake of fire is in heaven. Does that even make any sense remotely? No, of course not. Listen, election and free will are complementary, not contradictory. Elect is a title or description of saved people, like saint, and it also describes the act of God saving people. In John 6, Jesus said, No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up at that last day. And the election proponent would read this as God only draws those whom he has elected to. Does it say that? No. Does it imply that? No, then it's not true. What it does say very clearly is that if God wasn't drawing people, nobody would come. Because that's what scripture says elsewhere. There are none who seek after God. So what's he do? He comes looking for us. And some respond, but not all do. And all who respond, he will raise up at that last day when the dead in Christ rise first and we who are alive and remain meet him in the air. And in John 24, 22, in the heart of the Olivet Discourse, you guys still here? Yeah. Jesus said, and unless those days, the days of the tribulation, were shortened, no flesh would be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days will be shortened. Now, who are the elect? Well, in this passage, it's talking about the Jews. In Zechariah 12, 10, saved Jews specifically, Zechariah 12, 10 says, And I will pour on the house of David and on the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and supplication. Then they will look on me whom they pierce. Yes, they will mourn for him as one mourns for his only son and grieve for him as one grieves for a firstborn. Zechariah chapter 13 says, Two-thirds of the Jews are going to be cut off or they're going to die during the tribulation period. One-third of the Jews will look upon the one whom they pierced and mourn for him as one would mourn the loss of an heir uh, or a firstborn son. Now, were the one-third elected by God and the two-thirds rejected by God? Well, the answer comes from Romans 9, 27 and 28 and in verse, uh, chapter 10 as well, where Isaiah also writes out, uh, cries out concerning Israel, though the number of the children of Israel be as the sand of the sea, the remnant will be saved. That's the one-third. He will finish the work and cut it short in righteousness because the Lord will make a short work upon the earth. And in comparison to the whole scheme of time, tribulation is a very short time period. In Romans 10, 9 to 13, we're told if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the, one, for with the heart, one believes unto righteousness. Now pay attention. With the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture says, whoever believes on him will not be put to shame. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. For the same Lord over all is rich to all who call upon his name. For, read this out loud, whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. So why were the one third of the Jews at the end of the tribulation saved? Because they called on the name of the Lord. There's no distinction between the time of the Gentiles and the nation of Israel, even in the 70th week, as to how one can be saved. You must call upon the name of the Lord. Now, why would God desire for all to be saved if he predetermined that some can't be? Why would he write such a thing when he's already elected to send 
a good portion of humanity to hell without any type of free will choice. Now, two more verses that will make our point that's nothing but the truth. In Jeremiah 1, 4, then the word of the Lord came to me saying, before I was formed, before I formed you in the womb, I what? I knew you. Before you were born, I sanctified you. I ordained you a prophet to the nations. And then in Romans 8, 28 to 30, and we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are the called according to his purpose, for whom he what? Foreknew. He also predestined to be conformed into the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he predestined, these he also called. Whom he called, these he also justified. Whom he justified, these he also glorified. And because God dwells outside of time, he sees all time at the same time. He sees yesterday, today, and forever simultaneously. They're all the same to him. Isaiah 47, 10 reports that very thing. And the Lord tells Jeremiah, I knew you before you were born. What is one word that could describe such a phenomenon? Foreknew. He foreknew Jeremiah. God says he foreknows all who will love him and are the called according to his purpose. He has a predestined destination for them which Philippians 3.21 records as conformity into the image of the glorified Christ. Now, with this debate raging between free will and predestination, here's where we need to land. Listen this morning, neither free will or election change the meaning of the Great Commission. Neither free will or election change the meaning of the Great Commission. God desires all to be saved and to come to know the truth. So he gave us a commission to go to the world and preach the gospel to every creature. And listen, to refuse or fail to evangelize under the pretense of not wanting to give the non-elect false hope is disobedience to the word of God. And this is what many Calvinists will do, especially younger and hyper-Calvinists. They'll say, you know what? We don't need to go evangelize because uh, irresistible grace will just draw them in. And we don't want to tell someone who God has elected for hell that they can be saved and give them a false hope. That's nonsense. Jesus said, go to the world and preach the gospel. And this debate is, debate is going to go on until we go home. But whatever camp you land in, this is still true. And Jesus said to them, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He who believes and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. Please note he dropped the baptism part on the back half, because you don't need to be baptized to be saved. Baptism is a uh, outward sign of that inward work of belief. And listen, Calvinism and Arminianism are both wrong. Jesus is right. Amen. Preach the gospel to every creature. Whoever believes will be saved. And in conflict with the fifth point of uh, the Arminius position, they're not going to be saved temporarily. They will be saved eternally. And listen, if Ephesians 1.13 says when you get saved, you get a down payment of your future inheritance in the person of the Holy Spirit, that means you can't lose your salvation. Amen. I do not believe that you can lose your salvation if you're truly saved. I completely believe you think you are saved. You can think you're saved and not be. Yes. And Jesus covered that well in John, uh, Matthew, rather, chapter 7, verses 20 and 21. But in 2 Corinthians 5.21, we're told he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God in him. And this is what Paul is talking about in verse 5 where he says that there's only one mediator between God and man and it's not the Pope. It's the man, Christ Jesus. And the reason that this is important is because by law, a mediator is required to represent both sides equally. They're non-partial. And, and the truth of the matter is, there is no man who is qualified to represent God. Amen. And the reverse is true as well. That God was not a man, so he could not equally represent both sides. And therefore, he wrapped himself in the likeness of sinful flesh that he might mediate on behalf of humanity with a true and holy God. And listen... Paul says, Jesus, man's only mediator with God, gave himself as a ransom when the right time came to do so. 
And then Paul, and we'll conclude our time with this. Um, oh, I got tons of time. Yeah. <laughs> That's good because I got tons of message left too. So uh, uh, Paul goes on to say, and I, I want to talk about this because it's important and you need to know it and, and know the truth about it. He mentions that he was appointed as a preacher and an apostle of this message. Now, he says, I'm telling you the truth, and I'm not lying. Now, why would Paul say that? Well, because his apostleship was always being called into question because he wasn't one of the original 12. You know, you weren't there. Uh, you were fighting against the church. I mean, you were guarding Stephen's clothes or the people uh, who were stoning Stephen's clothes when he died. You were against us. You can't be an apostle because you weren't handpicked by Jesus. And, you know, part of the problem com uh, comes from this apostleship issue by not understanding how many apostles there actually were. Now, we do know that when Judas hung himself and died, he was replaced. And the apostles drew lots between those who had been with them since the beginning, and the lot fell on Matthias, who was the 12th apostle. But what we have to remember is that there were not just 12 apostles. There were 12 originals, minus one, plus one, plus two. Now, Galatians 1.9 ups the number by one. Paul writes, but I saw none of the other apostles except James. Now, there's three James in that group. James, the son of Alphaeus. James of the Boanerges pair, the sons of thunder as Jesus called James and John, the sons of Zebedee. But Paul qualifies another apostle by saying the Lord's brother. He's talking about the Lord's half-brother, and he says so here. And James, the Lord's half-brother, was not one of the original 12. As a matter of fact, he thought his brother had lost his mind. And all four Gospels record the fact that at one point in time, his family came to take charge of Jesus because they thought he was nuts because he was claiming to be the son of God. Well, they knew full well that he was uh, Mary's son, and he, they believed Joseph's as well. But then Paul goes on to say, so that 12 plus 1 is... Now, what was the delay in answering that question? I mean, 12 plus 1 is 13. So there's 13 apostles so far, right? Matthias was an apostle. And that rounded out the 12. James, the brother of the Lord was added to that number. And then finally, 1 Corinthians 15, 7 to 10. After that, he was seen by James, the Lord's half-brother, then by all the apostles. Then the last of all, he was seen by me also as one born out of due time, Paul speaking. For I am the least of the apostles, therefore Paul's claiming to be an apostle, who am not worthy to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And by the grace of God, you am what you am, and I am what I am too. Amen? Now, Paul, 13 plus 1, 14, would be the 14th apostle. He uses three Greek nouns to describe himself. He says he's a herald, a proclaimer. He says he is an apostle, which we just established. And then he adds that he's a teacher in faith and truth. Now, remember what Jesus said to the church at Ephesus in the seven letters. We talked about this a few weeks ago. Revelation 2.2, 2, Jesus says to Ephesus, I know your works, your labor, your patience, and that you cannot bear those who are evil. And you have tested those who say they are apostles and are not and have found them to be what? Liars. Found them to be liars. So claiming to be an apostle when you're not an apostle, Jesus himself says, is evil. And Paul is saying here, well, I've actually passed the test for apostleship in that I was appointed by Christ himself. I perform miracles by divine power and I have seen the Lord in his post-resurrection form. Now, there's a group today who claim to also have passed the test and met the apostolic criteria. They're called the New Apostolic Reformation, or NAR, they're often referred to. And therefore, those who are appointing one another as apostles claim to have been either visited by Jesus in a personified form, or they were transported into heaven and saw Jesus himself because they know full well that according to scripture, you have to be an eyewitness of the resurrected Lord to qualify as an apostle. So they say either he came to visit them or they came or went to see him. Now, how do we verify that claim? 
Well, we can't. We can't verify that claim as far as them uh, because they say, well, it happened. And if you believe they are modern day apostles, then you have to take them at their word, but their claim is actually contrary to scripture. And there's no way to confirm it. Now, the second criteria is that they do proclaim a gospel that Paul is mentioning here, uh, but they proclaim a variation of the gospel with much of their own amendments added to it. And it's funny how, how uh, much of what they teach today has something to do with Christians' wallets. Isn't that curious? But here's where they run into proof problems. They claim to do miracles. And one particular Northern California church in Northern California has a school of miracles. And uh, there's no school of miracles. The Holy Spirit, 1 Corinthians 12, 11, says he distributes the gifts individually as he wills. You can go to school for your whole life. And if he didn't give it to you, you ain't getting it. Amen? Amen. Now, they claim to do miracles, but the problem is none of the things that they claim to do look anything like what the other apostles did. Remember the lame man who lie at the gate, beautiful, begging alms one day, and two real apostles came by? Peter and John. Remember what happened? In Acts 3, 6 to 10, Peter said, silver and gold I do not have, but what I do have I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and lifted him, up, lifted him up. And immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. Peter gave him a pair of crutches and he hobbled around. What happened? So he, leaping up, stood and walked and entered the temple with them, walking, leaping, and praising God. And all the people saw him walking and praising God. And they what? What's the next word? They knew that it was he who sat begging alms at the beautiful gate of the temple. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. This is what biblical miracles performed through the apostles looks like. And then in Acts 2, 42 to 43, we're told they, the church, continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship in the breaking of bread and in prayers. Then fear came upon every soul. That's the fear of the Lord. And many wonders and signs were done through who? The apostles. the apostles. And listen, when Jesus or the apostles healed someone, there was no doubt that a miracle had taken place. None of them said, I sent someone in the room has a tumor that God is healing right now. How do you verify that? Well, you can't unless you go to the doctor and they present the evidence and all that. And listen, many of these so-called healers do just those kind of parlor tricks today. Uh, I sense this or I, I sense that, much like a medium will prod you for information and then tell you things that they uh, collected from you and, and it seems to be some type of miraculous uh, revelation. And listen, if somebody has the gift of healing today, they don't need to rent an arena and charge admission just go to the local hospital if you have the gift of healing and get the job done there. That would be legitimate. Listen, that would be biblical because that's exactly how the Lord would operate and did operate. When Jesus and the apostles told the lame to get up, they did. When they told the blind to see, they did. When they told the mute to speak, they did. When they told demons to get out, they did. When Jesus told the leper be healed, he was. He and the apostles told the dead to rise, they came to life. That's what apostolic and divine miracles look like. And in Luke 9, 1 and 2, he, Jesus, called his 12 disciples together and gave them power and authority over all demons to cure diseases. He sent them to preach the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. Mark 6, same setting, 12 to 13. So they went out and preached that people should what? Repent. And they cast out many demons and anointed oil and many who were with oil, many who were sick and healed them. Listen, if this were happening today, it would receive the same reaction that it did in Jesus' day. Hordes of non-believers would be flocking to these people to be healed and they would be. Does God heal today? Yeah. Well, of course he does. Uh, does he do miracles today? Yeah. Absolutely. Is there another group of apostles today equal to those appointed by Jesus? No. Now, 
Why is this important for you to know and for me to say? Because God called me to be a shepherd. And what does the shepherd do? He watches out for the sheep. And he points out masqueraders and those disguised as sheep, uh, wolves in sheep's clothing. It's part of my job to do this. And, and listen, here's our last point, and it, like the others, are nothing but the truth. Listen this morning. In light of all the sensationalism we see today and the fascination with signs and wonders and the experiential stuff going on in the church that is so um, highly admired and sought out, here's the truth. Knowing the one mediator is more important than seeing miracles, signs, and wonders. Amen. Knowing the one mediator is more important than seeing miracles, signs, and wonders. And much of the teaching in the church today is man-centric. What can you do? What can you have? How much you are loved. But what we need to hear and what the Bible teaches is what Christ has done for us, what we already have, and how we're supposed to love him. Amen. And in 2 Peter 1, 2-4, Peter says, Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord, as his divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us by glory and virtue by which have been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises that through these through these you may be partakers of the divine nature having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust we live in an age where sound doctrine is not put up with and fabrications are preferred by the masses but nothing is more important than knowing loving and serving the one mediator between god and man and that's the man christ jesus Amen. That's what anyone is going to learn if they hear the word of truth rightly divided because the entirety of the word of God is nothing but the truth. Somebody say amen. amen. And Father, we are grateful for our time today and we pray, God, that this would make it outside of the room. But Lord, we don't want to be uh, running around filled with negativity and finger pointing and as Dr. Uh, McGee would say, Lord, just running other people down being the only exercise we get. But Lord, we want to recognize that there are false teachers in these last days. And it was the first thing you said would be a sign of your soon coming. So Lord, help us uh, not to be fools, but be wise, redeeming the time, knowing that the days are evil. But Lord, I pray that in the midst of these evil days, we would do what you said that we would pray for Gavin Newsom. We pray for his perishing soul right now. We pray for Joe Biden, God. We pray for his perishing soul right now. We pray, Lord, that they would come to know you for the sake of their souls, but also for the benefit of our nation and state, that it would be a better U.S., a better California, and not experiencing the things we're going through because of evil plans. So, Lord, we want to be obedient to your word because it's what's best for us. And help us to remember that as we make decisions throughout the week. And we recognize that the entirety of your word is nothing but the truth. So help us to treat it as such as we make our way through these perilous times. We ask it now in Jesus' name. And all God's people said together, Amen. Amen.